Tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 17. Uh, we will not be able to get it all covered tonight, but uh, I know, surprise, surprise. But um, just to, coming off of the heels of Passover here, and we've been able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, I do want to remind you then tomorrow would, would the first fruits, first fruits would always land on the Sunday, and we do celebrate the resurrection of Jesus tomorrow. Don't forget to do that because uh, Passover is only the first part of it. And first fruits is uh, vital. Without that, uh, there would be no die new. So uh, just remember that as well. Anyway, uh, Revelation 17. <clears throat> Technically, <clears throat> Revelation should be over. We've got the vile judgments. The earth has all been cursed. Everything's you know, wiped out, but we're doing a rewind and we're going to go fill in details of what's going on here. So that's why we're, we're not done with Revelation yet. And what he's going to do is take us to Babylon, Mystery Babylon, and show us that he is just. Why was he destroying this world? We often hear that God is unjust in bringing this justice, but um, <clears throat> it isn't. We've gone over that before. God is very just in his punishment. He is not wrong. It is not unloving. It is not unjust. It is a must that he bring punishment on this earth, and you're going to see why. Now, when we get into Babylon, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know who it is. There are a few that are in the running. We know that the early disciples actually called Jerusalem Babylon, and they did so... Uh, from my understanding, more in a secretive way uh, to kind of hide from uh, the Romans and their, their Christianity kind of thing. But we also know <clears throat> that the United States of America is in the running. A lot of people, as we're going to talk about here, um, will assign the possibility that we could be what is being talked about here. And I think that that's a very legitimate possibility. And there are others in the running, but I think that the most obvious um, would be either Jerusalem or Babylon. But Jerusalem, I don't believe, fits the description here. And so those that say Jerusalem is Babylon, I think, yes, there is that... Um, it being pointed to, but it doesn't fit the description in any other way. Therefore, it's something else. <clears throat> maybe it's the United States, maybe it's not, but we'll kind of just keep that in mind as we go. Um, another thing I want you to understand is, before we get started too much, in back in chapter 13, we saw that the Antichrist was going to rule over many nations. And that means that the United States is going to lose its sovereignty someday. Keep that in mind, because the Antichrist is going to be the one that's ruling over all nations. So we won't be the one in charge. Even if the United States remains, it won't be the president that's running things. Oh, come to think of it, maybe we're already there. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that I think is important to point out is that we just saw Jesus as prophet. We've seen Jesus as priest in Passover. But it's hard to see Jesus as king. Oh yeah, I know they put king of the Jews above on the cross when he was crucified. But where do we really see that Jesus is king? Oh yeah, people bowed down before him. He had control over the, the wind and the waves. But he was never really king. And that's the other reason that Revelation is so important, is it is the completion of that. When he is coming, when we read in Revelation 11 that the kingdom of this world has now become the kingdom of our God, that that whole idea of Jesus being prophet, priest, and king without Revelation doesn't really come together. And so that's an important part to understand what's happening here. He's bringing destruction, 
<coughs> as king. So we've got some very interesting things going on in the world before we get started that I'm going to point out here to kind of keep in mind. I was talking with Mark earlier here, and my spirit is just different than it has been before. And I don't know how to describe it outside of I'm not anxious, I'm not fearful, but I would say I'm confident. There's a confidence in my spirit about things are falling apart. We know that, and I don't know if you've uh, been paying much attention in the news here lately, but uh, this last week or two in Israel, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Uh, politics, uh, I believe it was a week ago Monday, everything was shut down. Uh, hotels, uh, you name it, everything, museums, store. It, it was an order to shut everything down. An order that had no um, merit or authority to do so, even. And now they're being fired on. And now they're being fired on. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff going on there, but what was fascinating about it is in talking with a few people from that area, is it sounded exactly like what was going on in America in many ways. Not, I mean, there's some differences, but in many ways it was the same thing. They are even saying they all know George Soros is behind it. That he's doing the funding. In other words, there's stuff going on around the world, and it isn't the politics of the country itself. It's not the Republicans and the Democrats or, or this party or that party, but there is some global elite powers that are moving and doing the very same thing to bring dissension and to collapse governments, to set up for a world government. This coming May, at the end of the month, they are meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. Biden uh, has a meeting, and I'm not sure all the details of it outside of it. A big part of it has to do with who? The World Health Organization. And having the UN be in complete control of that and appointing a person that would be in charge of it that would then control from a world's perspective. Part of this is because when the pandemic took place, the first one, it, it wasn't successful completely because not everybody would comply. You still had people that refused to wear masks who would, were able to get around things by you know, getting exemptions and so on. <clears throat> and this would ensure that there would be no power within each country to make their own rules, but you would have a one, literally a world dictator that would be in charge of the health so that if you don't have your QR code, you don't fly. If you don't have your QR code, you don't buy. <coughs> now again, I don't know if where this is all is going to go. I don't know who's going to vote against it, in, but at the same time, we know that at the end of May, that's what there's this, this meeting going on. There's stuff like this happening all over. And it should cause us to take a step back and say, okay, this is serious. We could be living out Revelation. As I've been saying in the last few weeks, more and more, I'm starting to get more convinced that perhaps what I taught three years ago in the white horse coming about with the, the COVID is quite possible. Because from COVID or from the white horse, the white horse was the Antichrist, but it wasn't necessarily that he's revealed as much as maybe he is allowed to now begin. And that there are powers being set up, powers that are in control. The red horse, we talked about communism and war. We're right on track. We could see that happening 
at any time, really, which naturally brings, as I said, death and famine and plague and, well, then persecution would be the fifth seal. I don't know when these things are going to take place. All I know is that we're seeing things. And in my spirit, as I said, it's not fear, it's not anxiousness, it's a confidence of the Lord bringing these things about. It's a confidence that, yep, it's happening. What it is exactly, I don't know, but I have that sort of confidence, but yet a peace, and that God is, in my spirit, telling you, you keep going. Keep doing the things you're doing. But you do need to be prepared in your spirit and in your heart. And I think what we're going to be talking about tonight here in Revelation 17 only builds on this fact that something's happening. Because... I feel like we can see Revelation 17 around us. It says this in verse 1, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So it starts out here, one of the seven angels who has poured out all of these judgments, who had these seven bowls, is saying, come, I'm going to show you. I'm showing you why this happened. I'm going to show you why this is going to take place, in essence, in John's day here. <clears throat> but what he shows is the judgment of this great harlot. Now, in Scripture, we determine uh, harlotry has always been a picture of those who have rebelled against God. Not necessarily not religious. Matter of fact, most often, very religious. I don't like to call myself religious because I'm not. Matter of fact, if you look up religion in the Bible, religion is always outside of one case in a negative term. The only time it's in a positive term, it, it comes with a, a, a disclaimer. I think it's in James where it talks about, and this is true religion. It has to define what it is. Religion can be in a lot of forms. There's a lot of churches that are very religious, but are harlots. And so, this harlot sits on many waters, it says. Well, we don't have to wonder what that means. Because if you jump ahead and look at verse 15, it's going to tell you, that the many waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, languages. So this harlot, this ungodly religious thing, is sitting on many nations, languages. This isn't just a, you know, a, a world power like China or a world power like Russia or like the United States. This is something in the background that is controlling all of them, a world power at this point. Now we're going to see she's called Mystery Babylon here before. Mystery because we don't know. It's a mystery. I feel that's kind of almost the reality we're living in right now. That there is a power, nobody knows for sure who it is. We, we know some figures involved, but that's running the world right now not just the United States. And it says that with whom the kings of the earth commit fornication, the kings of the earth being those in power again. Boy, I'll tell you, I don't know if I trust any politician in any country because they're all corrupt. Now, fornication, I think, probably is in relation to the same aspect of harlotry with, with God, but <clears throat> we also have seen in the recent years how much actual fornication, child molestation, and all of those things have been going on in the, the, the elites, not just in America, but around the world. And the inhabitants of the earth are made drunk with the wine 
of her fornication. Look at the, the uh, you want to make money? Do a porn site, right? I mean, you, you're guaranteed to make money. The whole world seems to have gone sexually mad with the wine of her fornication. And, and maybe, like I said, it's just, it fits both, is what I'm saying. Both the spiritual and the, the actual physical of what's going on. I mean, we're, we're seeing, my wife and I tried to watch a Disney film not long ago, and we couldn't even finish it because it was sexualizing high school students so much. And this is the world that we are in. Again, it's not just the United States. I mean, we know Ukraine has been a hub of sex trafficking. Uh, we know Indonesia, before that great tsunami, it was a hub of sex trafficking and child you know, pornography. Everywhere we turn, this is the kind of thing we're seeing. And so, in a sense, this prostitute, this harlot, is a false church. Okay, a, a false religious system. And maybe it's going to be the church in general. Maybe it's going to be the United States in general. But I think that as far as what we see, since it's called a harlot, there's a religious aspect to this that it seems to be something with a religious organization. Remember, we have a dragon in Revelation 13, a false prophet, and an antichrist. There's going to be a political system that is in control by Satan. There's going to be a religious system in control of Saint, by Satan. And then there's going to be the dragon, the head behind it all. But all is there. And notice that these people don't just drink, they indulge. They drink it down to the, they, they can't get enough. They want every last drop. In Romans 1 verse 32 it says, although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things but approve of those who practice them. There was a day in our politics that if a president was immoral he would have lost office. And around the time of Clinton, and I know there were things even before that, but around the time of Clinton, there was a, a pretty sharp turn to where it didn't matter anymore. That we would approve of those who practice them because it really doesn't affect us. It doesn't matter. I mean, Aiken's sin, it was Aiken that did it. It wasn't us. So we're going to be fine, right? Wrong. It doesn't work that way. Well, verse 3 goes on and it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So now we're getting a bird's eye view of this false church this woman. Now, I think the woman itself or herself is the religious aspect. But remember, she's sitting on many waters. She is going to have this sitting on a beast as well. And this beast has all these kings. It has these seven uh, horn or seven heads and ten horns. We don't need to wonder what that is either because in verse 12, if you jump ahead, it's going to tell you that the ten kings are ruling on seven hills, and the seven, the seven horns are seven hills, and the seven hills are also seven kings, and then the ten heads are ten kings, therefore you've got 17 kings on seven hills. 17 main power people. So... <clears throat> We know verse, verse 9 is also where it will tell you the seven hills, uh, explaining what that is. But the point being is, this isn't just one thing. There is a 
a number of things, religious, political, and a number of kings involved, a number of, of global elitists, you might say. I'm going to propose that one of the leading, for me, explanations is that this is actually Rome, upon where the Vatican sits. Interestingly, Rome was always called the city of seven hills. I would say Rome throughout history has been one of the uh, main explanations of who this woman rides a beast is throughout history. And I think it still holds up to this day. But again, it's only a portion of it. It's not all of it. So we always think, oh, the Antichrist is going to be, you know, the Pope or whatever. It's, but we have to realize that there's a religious and a political system here. Well, some of the things that we can see that are most obvious here that are described on this scarlet beast... I'm sure you've seen pictures, and I'll show you some more later. Rome, what do they always dress up in? These scarlet uh, robes, right? We know that she's arrayed in purple and scarlet. That's the, the colors that we're going to see in the Roman church most often. Adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a gold cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. We'll talk about some of these things here uh, soon, but just take note of them. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 3, we had all of these different, you know, there was the statues, and then there were these animals, and we've got it all figured out, as I mentioned before. We've got, well, it's uh, first it's the Babylonians, and then it's the Medes and the Persians, and then it's uh, a picture of the Greeks, and then it's a picture of the Romans, and then Jesus comes. And everybody kind of has it all figured out, but Twice Daniel says in saying it, these are things that are going to happen in the end times. And we've made the end times happen when Rome fell. So it's, it's over. Those can only be patterns of something in the end. And in the end times, Daniel's dreams are telling us Rome is the last one. And then we see that Rome, the, the, the kingdom of Rome, <coughs> there are ten toes. Just like here we're seeing ten kings. There's a connection somehow to these things. I would love to be able to sit here and be able to tell you, I'm going to tell you exactly what they are. But I don't think anybody knows. And I don't think we will know until it begins to unfold. But when it does, then I think you're going to know if you know the, the word, then you're going to understand it. Well, we're told that the fourth beast in Daniel, as I said, is going to have ten horns. We see in Revelation 17, 3, the same thing. Um, it seems in Daniel... When Daniel goes on and talks about it, we're not going to get into Daniel too much tonight. That this is it's going to reign, this king is going to reign for three and a half years and then go after the saints. It's kind of what we see in Revelation 11 as well. There's these three and a half years of the two witnesses prophesying. He comes and kills those two witnesses and then goes after them. It seems to me that what Satan is doing that we have pointed out numerous times throughout the book of Revelation already, is that he is mimicking everything that God does. Literally, everything. If you look at the priests in the Bible times, at least on you know, the high priests, they were decked out in gold, precious stones, many colors, purple, scarlet, both of those colors were there. And here we're seeing that the harlot's going to do the same. We see as well that she has a cup, a golden cup filled. Well, the priests had these golden bowls as well. We see that the priests wore on their, their mitre, holy to the Lord. But on this one, we're going to see coming up that she has mother of harlots or mother of abominations ultimately. 
on her forehead. So everything seems to be mocking what Jesus does. Notice Jesus comes down to the earth. Where is she coming from? She's going to be coming up from the earth. In Daniel 7, let's just read a little bit of what it says here in verses 23 through 27. The angel gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth. I'm going to propose to you that what we're seeing going on in the world today is different than anything we have ever, ever seen before. trampling it down, crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. What kingdom? The fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom being a Roman kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High, oppress his saints, and try to change the set times and the laws the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time, but the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. God wins. Okay, that's the paraphrase. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. Sounds like Revelation 11. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God, and the time to reward his saints has come. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers, or all rulers will worship and obey him. We definitely haven't seen that yet. So I'm telling you, it didn't end in 70 AD. It didn't end with the fall of the Roman kingdom. And I don't think then, according to scripture, that we can say Rome is gone. Rome is still very alive. And... <clears throat> The very fact that the kingdom Daniel's talking about is Rome, I think, indicates that what John is talking about here in Revelation with Babylon could actually maybe be Rome, or at least part of that, <coughs> the city in which the Antichrist is going to sit. Coming from this kingdom, it said, could mean that there is a central seat, but the king's are spread out throughout the whole world. But the power seat, the one that's making the decisions, is based in Rome. Again, just deductive reasoning from scriptures is all we can say at this point. But looking at these verses in Revelation, I want to just show you some pictures here. First of all, here is in the Catholic Church. Look at the scarlet and purple. You might see all the rosaries with the pearls decked out, the gold crosses. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to the Vatican, but it's amazing. One of the most lavish buildings on earth. So I think that this great prostitute in verse 1, this harlot here, since she's considered to be religious, you cannot rule out Rome yet in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Not just the Catholic Church, like, you know, the one downtown, but the very head, the Vatican, the seat of power, the office of the papacy. Um, it's interesting that the description of the temple colors were called Babylonian colors by Josephus. And... Here, we're seeing the prostitute again mimicking those colors. But Jerusalem, the priest, the temple, had some of the same colors in there. But again, it's because of a mimicking. I think John seems to be playing the earthly Jerusalem against the heavenly Jerusalem, in a sense. If this could be Jerusalem at all. But the point being is, this isn't the Jerusalem we're thinking of. Okay, But perhaps, maybe, that's why the angel, when he shows John the prostitute in chapter 17 here, that he's going to marvel at this, as you'll see coming up. 
because it's a religious system. Almost kind of like when Ezekiel was shown and they were worshiping the sun and bowing down to, you know, all those pagan gods. So anyway, <clears throat> as I said, Rome has been known as the city of seven hills. Um, Exodus 25 here, I show you in the temple the same kind of colors as well. But we've talked about that. Here's a picture of the Vatican, just a tiny portion of it. Um, and if you go there, as I said, it is very lavish and probably one of the most magnificent architectural sites that you can go to today. What's that? You know, I don't know. Anybody know when the Vatican was built? Yeah, hard to say. The plans were approved at the Council of Nicaea. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't want to say that, you know, the Vatican is the only church that gets caught up in materialism and lavishness because, you know, we've got the Crystal Cathedral. We've got a lot of those things that are out there. But they pale compared to the Vatican. I will say that. There are things when you look up and it looks like there are letters that are on there that are about this high that are actually six feet high, the letters are. Yeah. In their mosaics. Many of the statues that are in there actually come from the Pantheon. Um, they just gave them names of saints or you know people in the Bible versus the gods that they were. And that's kind of where we're going to be leading into. Um, I want to say, though, first in Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched Daniel Joseph last week, but a tremendous one on prosperity gospel and a disgusting intro of pastors claiming, you know, the name it, claim it theology. <clears throat> and, I mean, just the boldness of what they would say, too, is just, absolutely disgusting that is not christianity james warns your gold and silver are corroded their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire you have hoarded wealth in the last days <clears throat> tell you what i think that daniel's message last week you need to go back and listen to that on corner fringe from april 1st because boy if that isn't it talking about <clears throat> the pleasures that we seek and one of the things that he was talking about was your bucket list what's on your bucket what's in your bucket list or on your bucket list in your bucket or on your bucket list right but anyway the point being <clears throat> is he says today we in our culture we have become so accustomed to the lavishness and the wealth that God has blessed us with that our bucket list is usually, I want to go see this, I want to go see that, I want to experience this, I want to go have fun doing that. And if we are focused on God and doing what we're here for, it should be more like, I want to have more, I want to have more prayer in my life, I want to be serving more people more often, I want to be a better father, I want to be a better leader, a better husband, I, I want, you know, something about God. And our buckets are not usually being filled with those things. It's being filled with the, the pleasure. And we're hoarding up experiences and things like that. That, my friends, is a spirit of the Antichrist. And I'm going to say most of us in America don't even know that we are participating in it. But that is part of it. This is part of the wine that we want every last drop of to drink down to its dregs. Is that right? Okay. I don't even know what dregs mean. I'm just kind of quoting scripture. But, yeah, so, but we want every last drop of it. I do. I do. And it's interesting it calls it wealth in the last days here too. So there has been a lot of talk recently, every year at this time, Easter is not pagan. Okay? Facebook gets filled with it, all of that. 
Well, I agree and I disagree. I know for many, many years, I have uh, been talking, I mean, 20 years ago, I heard Easter and Ishtar are the same thing. As of late, there's a lot of things that, where's the evidence of that? And I'll be honest, I don't know if I can really prove that Easter and Ishtar, the words themselves, are related. And that there, it could come from a German Oster and all of these kind of things, which might, kind of takes you back to April and spring and all of this. I was talking with Simeon here just a little bit ago and saying, I think we're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, is Easter and Ishtar the same thing? Or is Easter pagan? That's not the question you're supposed to be asking. That is a distraction. Big summary, the real question is, what did God tell us to do? Okay, so whether Easter is pagan or not wouldn't matter. What would matter is, why are you making up something to worship God when God told you to do it this way? It's the same thing Jeroboam did, making, he said, hey, we're going to worship the God of Israel, but we're going to do it on a month of my own choosing, and where I want you to do it. Was that based on paganism? No. Based on selfishness and other things. But I think most of the people that began to do that were truly thinking, we're going to worship Yahweh. But what was interesting is that paganism or pagan aspects were brought into it. What did he set up? Did he set up a... a a picture of Yahweh? No, he set up a golden calf. Where did they get that from? Egypt, right? And so it wasn't that, hey, they're even Christianizing a pagan holiday. They were trying to worship God, but in a way they wanted to. Not in a way God told them to. With that said, I do believe that while maybe we cannot prove, although there is evidence out there that Ishtar and Ishtar are the same, Easter are the same things, it seems like newer evidence coming out is kind of trying to knock that off. So personally, I don't know what to think on that. I think there is a chance there may be no connection to the words themselves. But I can tell you this, Easter was being practiced before Germany was a thing. So if it's a German word, it makes no difference. Constantine in 325 AD, they had already been practicing Easter. It was, that was the whole thing, is they were going to say, we don't want to do what the Jews are doing, and when are we going to do this? And he established, we're going to do Easter, and we're going to do it here at this time. Okay? And so there's plenty of historical evidence talking about that. So it was, it was around back then. And therefore, again, the word origins aren't the issue. That's the wrong question. I will say this. Here is a picture of Dagon, the priest, holding the world in his hands. Now these are things from archaeology and arts and, and all over the place throughout centuries. And yet, it's very similar to what we see in the Vatican. Okay? We, I mean, I could give you lots and lots of these kind of things. I just want to give you an example for the point. Here is Dagon the fish god. We see more pictures of Dagon the fish god. Here it is in some archaeological pictures and so on. But what's interesting is here is the Pope and his picture. Now, you're going to be able to go and read, well, was, was the Pope actually trying to worship Dagon here? I don't think so. I don't think that he was trying to Christianize, you know, Dagon worship. I think that there is a spirit that is behind this that will cause even good, well-meaning people to bring ungodly practices into their lives without them even knowing it. Technically, this hat, I don't even think, comes around until like 1305 or something like that. 
But why? Maybe it's because of the spirit behind the thing to begin with. Because you see, we don't battle with flesh and blood. We battle with principalities. And there is too much of a connection to Babylon to this very present day to say that there isn't a connection. Jeremiah 51 says, Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand. She made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, they have now gone mad. Babylon will suddenly fall and be broken. This was in the days of Jeremiah. The same thing we're reading in Revelation. Now in Jeremiah, I think he was actually talking about Babylon, the literal Babylon. But are we asking the wrong question? Which city is it? Is it New York? Is it Chicago? Is it L.A.? Or maybe it is the very spiritual, satanic seat of Babylon. That Babylon isn't necessarily a location, although it's going to use a location, but it's more so a philosophy a, a spiritual, satanic root. I, again, want to make it clear that I don't think that the church is doing paganism when they do Easter. I believe that people who are going to go tomorrow and, and worship and celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua are in their minds worshiping God and they are not they have not even a, a thought of paganism in their minds and that's okay but it is not what God has asked us to do he gave us the festival of first fruits which happens to be on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection so I think there's a better way a more biblical way to celebrate the resurrection. But I also believe... Brian, first fruits always on a Sunday? Yeah, it is, always. Daniel Joseph had a message on that that was really good too. That Again, it, it really shows Sunday is not an evil day. It's not a bad thing. But we do need to all ask ourselves, wait a minute, have we allowed Babylon to creep into our lives, into our culture, into our church because... It's all we know. It's what we grew up with. And I think that's what we're going to see here uh, in, a, in a very clear way. That there have been cultural influences that have led us to where we are today. Um, I think that when it comes to Easter and all of that, I think... I don't have the pictures here right now, but you might remember that I showed you some other things where maybe the best way to, to study this out is don't try and figure out what the root word of Easter is and where it came from. Go read the Gilgamesh epic from Babylon. Go read about Ishtar. Go read about Tammuz and Samaranus and Nimrod. Uh, it'll be in the Babylonian epic, you know, of Gilgamesh. And what you're going to see is that there was Nimrod mentioned in Scripture. And Nimrod is going to get killed by a wild boar. You're going to see that uh, he had married Samaranus. Samaranus is going to get miraculously impregnated, supposedly by the sun. And the baby is Tammuz. And so throughout ancient archaeology, we see pictures of Samaranus and baby Tammuz. Some of them, as I, if you remember me showing you before, it looks like the Virgin Mary and Jesus. And I can show you pictures from Egypt with the exact same thing. But what they did is they changed the names. Okay, What was Samaranus and Tammuz in others... Uh, and I don't remember all, but like you've got Venus and another planet, and then you've got Aphrodite and, and this other one. You, you, depending on the culture, you've always got the same one with a miraculous baby being born. 
all of them sound very much like the Bible and Jesus being born by the Virgin Mary, a miraculous birth. And by the way, Tammuz is then killed and he resurrects three days later. Okay, So again, Satan has been mimicking what God was going to do, what God has done throughout all of history. And so what I see is more, wow, what we're celebrating and some of the things that we have have roots all the way back to Babylon, to Nimrod. And you really can't deny that those stories are universal throughout the world. And here we're seeing a harlot that is a world power and makes the whole world drink of her dregs, her, her, the wine of her adulteries, her fornications, her religious aspect. There is a religious aspect to what she's doing. By the way, a lot of the sex trafficking and things that go on with the elites, there's a religious aspect to that as well. We have other things too. The Catholic, uh, these are just some things that you can look up. I, I mean, this, this is a small sample of many. We talked about this when we went over the Sabbath. But uh, here in the Catholic Mirror, James Cardinal Gibbons says, The Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday for worship. Remember, the, the, what well, we're going to see, this Antichrist was going to change set times and seasons. Changing set times. I, I mean, are we talking like going from Rolex to Timex? What? No, we're talking about festivals, set times, appointed times. Cardinal Gibbons in The Faith of Our Fathers says... You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which the Catholic Church never sanctify. Catholic Record of London, Ontario. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this trans transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic Church says that Sunday worship is proof of their authority. And I mean, you can find that in so many places. Up a, oh, I can't remember. I, we had it in the Sabbath thing when it first was changed, but I don't remember what it was. I, it was around that time, yeah. Somewhere in there, yeah. I just don't remember the exact date, but it was around Constantine there. Uh, here's another one. Protestants do not realize that by observing Sunday, they accept the authority of the spokesperson of the church, the Pope. Here's another one. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. We have here as well. The commandments. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, These are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that you might fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Or Deuteronomy 6, 8, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. God gave them the commandments. You're supposed to do it whatever, you know, whatever land you go in to take to possess. And then he says, to remind you of that, put this stuff on your forehead and on your hand. We've already talked about this in the sense that this is the mark of God. And yet, Satan wants to mimic that by a mark on the bee, of the beast. And it's interesting that on her forehead, in verse 5, it says... A name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. <coughs> As I said, the priests had holy to the Lord. Why? Why? Because holiness is written on your forehead. The commandments are holy. It is written on your forehead, and yet here, the opposite. A, a mimicking, a mocking of that very thing. But as I said, mystery Babylon the Great. 
I think that means we're not going to know until it is starting to happen. You are going to know eventually. But for us to, to be dogmatic about what it is, I would be very cautious about that at this point. The mother of harlots. Well, the mother of spiritual adultery? Like I said, if I look at what has gone on in the churches today, what we have put the term Christian to, there's no question it has roots in Babylon. Maybe a different name, maybe different practice, maybe even the, a good reason as far as to worship God. But there is no question that we have Babylonian roots that the culture has taken part of, whether it be names of the days, names of the months. There are roots that go all the way back. Rome had roots of Babylon. And that's the thing is, as I mentioned before, you had the pantheon. Some of these gods were the ones that they came from the Greeks and then to the Romans. And then from the Romans, they get, went into the Catholic Church, the pantheon. When the Romans, uh, I, let me think this through, um, Babylon. In, the, in Daniel's day, the seat was there, you know, at Babel, basically, Babylon. Well, when his son took over, when they were, the Medes and the Persians conquered it, it was actually at Pergamos, which is, if you recall, the town that is mentioned in Revelation there uh, in the churches, in chapters 2 and 3 there. When the Romans conquered, like around 133 B.C., somewhere in there, the Romans moved what was in Babylon that went to um, Pergamos, then went to Rome. And so it just hopped. And so they just, they kind of took in some of the things. Again, maybe for different reasoning, but that same spirit remained in all of it. And that's what we're seeing, I think, today as a mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. We've never been able to get Babylon out of our culture. You know, like I said, God was able to get you out of Egypt, but he couldn't get Egypt out of the people. So anyway, yeah, Biden being Catholic is an interesting concept. I don't know if it means anything, probably not. But I can tell you this, that the, Cat the Vatican has been very much in control of politics. How many presidents go to the Vatican? Every one of them. Okay, um, what's the evil, the Jesuits? Okay, I know the guy that I was with in India used to teach at a Jesuit school and he had his life threatened like literally like they were going to kill him and uh, if you do some reading up on Jesuits and the evils that go on in there you know that there is some very powerful people there this is still Rome folks and they are maybe not in the front to where everybody gets to see them but they are pulling strings of other people in ways that I don't even think we are privy to. And so it does make you wonder how much uh, the Catholic Church could be involved in this because that is what Rome is today. The Vatican is its own country. Okay? It is literally its own country. Verse 6 says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Again, is he marveling because this is, uh, wow, this shouldn't be happening in the church. This is, the, whoa. And drunk with the blood, <clears throat> we can see, I mean, yes, Muslims have killed many people. And I do think Muslims and Catholics, if you know, they've joined hands pretty tightly here uh, in recent years. But we know that the Catholic Church has been the source of many Christian persecutions. And they have shed the blood of many, especially when you talk about Jesuits. So, <clears throat> it's considered to be a place of saint slaughter. In Revelation 18, 24, it says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. So, there's some very anti-Christian 
thing about this woman. Yet she's religious. Dan, uh, Dave Hunt has a book called The Woman Rides a Beast. You might want to check that out and you can see the murders and uh, the evils that have gone on through the papacy throughout the years. Uh, really well documented and researched. So, <clears throat> since we've already discussed that the seven heads are hills and the ten horns are kings, uh, we see that the dragon is Satan and the, that dragon is the one that gives power to and control of these, or control to the ten kings, basically. So Babylon may be Rome, but it could also be a world government with its main control center being Rome. Hence the need for the ten kings. It might give further insight into the many waters then upon which the church and the beast sit, because... Here's the center of power, as I said before, but it's worldwide. We've got all of this stuff going on. So Seven seas and seven continents. Seven seas and what? Seven continents. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, verse 7, I'm going to wrap up here. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So, first of all, it's the ungodly that are going to marvel and, and like, oh, but we are going to go like, yeah, told you. <laughs> So that's good news. Daniel puts it this way. You know, go your way, Daniel, until the end. Okay, for the words are, are sealed up and, and the words of the scroll are, are sealed until the time of the end. But he says, none of the wicked, none of the wicked will understand. Okay, but the righteous will understand. And so we don't have to be so worried I'm not saying forget about it, but I, I, I'm also saying don't dwell on trying to get an answer to this. God is going to reveal it. He promises that. If you are one who is walking in His Word, and you're following Him, and you have come out of Babylon, we'll see that later, come out of her, my people. When you come out of Babylon, I think your eyes are going to be open to things that you didn't get to see before. I suspect that some of you have already become to come, become, are becoming, I can't even get that word, are getting out of Babylon <laughs> a little bit already. And I'll bet already you've seen your eyes being opened up to scriptures in new ways. I really feel that that's what it's going to be like as God is saying, come out because you've you got to get rid of Babylon and then you're going to be able to see you're going to be able to understand. And so, this angel has to bring John back from his marveling to remind him who this woman truly is. How many times do we need that in our world today? I think sometimes we marvel at the world and Christianity and whatnot, but we have to be, whoa, whoa, whoa. we got to be brought out from our marveling to see and understand what truth is. Um, the abyss here as well, the beast that you saw that is and is not, he's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Remember, he comes out of the ground, Jesus comes down. Well, the abyss is a dreaded place throughout Scripture, even where demons reside. In Luke, Jesus cast out the legion and they begged him repeatedly, do not send us into the abyss, Luke 8, 31. In uh, chapter 9, verse 1 of Revelation, we saw Satan was given a key to the abyss to let his demon followers out. So the abyss is not a good place. We read in chapter 20 of God's control of Satan, he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. So since this beast is coming out of the abyss, it's more probable that there is 
maybe a demon under Satan's authority that is being uh, coming out here, not Satan himself possibly. And lastly, the beast that was, is not, and yet is, again, a mimic, a mockery of the one who is and who was and is to come. Uh, that comparison there. We're going to talk about what that means next time we meet. <coughs> but for now, I just wanted you to see a little connection to Rome, to our world today, and just uh, get you pondering a little bit about Babylon and, and us. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We may not understand it all, but we trust that you will give us understanding someday. Those who are wise will understand, and those who lead many to righteousness are going to shine like the brightness of the heavens. God, let us lead others to righteousness, to, to pull people out of Babylon, to, to get them to see the truth of your word and that we would all take a step back and say, God, I just want to follow you. I want to do what you've asked us to do and not what I want to do. That we would fill our buckets or put on our bucket list things that are pleasing to you, not things that are just serving ourselves, not things that are of this world, but that it, it, those things would be meaningless to us. Change our heart, Lord. Change our hearts that we would not lust after those things. Let us have a, a desire and, and a, an urgency for the lost. That we wouldn't worry about what people think of us, but that we would worry that they're not going to be in heaven. And that we would be bold enough, humble enough to look like a fool if that's what it takes. To, to not care if people think that we're strange but that we have an audience of one. We thank you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen.